They can't keep doing this to me. I am pausing everything that I'm doing currently, and I'm going to talk about Swindle. I decided to open up my Twitter account for the first time in like three months, and what do I see immediately? Another white boy is going to cover something that I planned to talk about years ago. First Mabav, then Wizards of Waverly Place, and now Swindle? I can't allow it. I just, I can't allow it. For those unaware, I'm currently working on a video about the TV show My Babysitter is a Vampire. But while I was working on the Mabav video, some white boy dropped a three hour long video about it. And now I look like the idiot. Same thing with Wizards of Waverly Place. Almost two years ago, I watched the show and then wrote a script about my personal opinions on it. And I just kind of threw it in the trash because I didn't feel confident enough to make YouTube videos back then. And then a white boy does the video before me. And now I see that Quentin Reviews is going to talk about Swindle. And I can't, I can't let it happen a third time. So I'm pausing working on the Mabav video for now, and I'm going to talk about Swindle. I am sorry to everybody who's expecting the Mabav video. I need to do this now. If anyone's wondering for how long I've been waiting to talk about Swindle, when I originally wrote this script, I was referencing the fact that Ariana Grande had just recently decided to revive her acting career. So that was right when she was announced to be casted in Wicked, which was November of 2021. This was supposed to come out after I did my video on Heathers, which I have a hard time watching, so I wouldn't recommend going back and looking at that. But this was supposed to come out very soon after that, and I just never got around to making it. Again, I was self-conscious. I don't give a fuck anymore. I need to talk about Swindle. If you're watching this video now, I need you to keep this in mind. Swindle is a good movie. It is worth your time, and you should check it out. I am way beyond the point of caring or being embarrassed for liking a kid's movie. Whenever a review about Swindle comes out and people start talking about it again because Quinted Reviews reviewed it in his goddamn 24 hour video, I want you to get those 25 year old cynical opinions out of your mind and watch this video and watch the movie in a pure true form. See, when people ask me if I'm a movie buff, I usually say yes, but I'm too embarrassed to tell them what kinds of movies I watch because they're mostly made-for-TV rip-off movies that are like a pastiche on an already popular and way better film. And Swindle is exactly one of those. So Swindle is a movie that aired on Nickelodeon in August of 2013, and it's genuinely one of my favorite films to watch. I watch it all the time. Nothing cheers me up more like a made-for-TV movie with dramatic plots. I could snuggle up with a good geek charming and a cup of apple cider and just, just really feel, feel comfortable with life. The Swindle really has a star-studded cast. This was basically the Avengers of Nickelodeon at the time. And what was so wonderful about it is that all of the actors got to kind of play against their typecast for the time. For example, Ariana Grande is playing a character that very much is not like Cat Valentine in any way. First of all, she gets to use her real voice, and she gets to play like a mean, popular girl. Noah Monk is basically playing a version of Sam Puckett. I mean, there's parole officer jokes, and he's very aggressive and is willing to beat people up. And Jeanette McCurdy gets to play like a soft, kind of nerdy, quirky, girly girl instead of the brutish Sam Puckett. And Noah Crawford, who is basically the main character of this movie, is supposed to be this really suave, cool, nerdy kind of guy. I mean, this man wears a blazer and jeans to school every day and for some reason does not get beat up because of this. We'll get into why that is later. However, Chris O'Neill and Sierra Bravo don't get this kind of luxury. Chris O'Neill is basically playing the exact same character he did in How to Rock, except he's a little bit less girl crazy. Just a little bit, though. And Sierra Bravo is still in menaced little sister mode, but you know, at least she gets to be like a computer hacker now. Before I get into anything, I want to talk about How to Rock for a second because I feel like I'm the only person who's seen this show. I know that's a lie because there have been a few videos about How to Rock, but for those who don't know, How to Rock is a short-lived musical sitcom that aired in 2012. It was about this popular girl who gets shunned by her popular friends and ends up joining a band with the lame outcasts of the school where they perform cheesy, shitty, overcompressed pop music together. This TV show also has Max, 
who you might remember as being one of the main characters in Rags, another movie I will talk about before some white boy gets to it, I hope. The main character is played by Symphonique Miller, who is in the lead role, and then Max plays her love interest. Also, the girl from Good Luck Charlie is the antagonist in this show, so that's pretty cool. Noah Crawford and Chris O'Neill were kind of paired together as this comedy duo. Again, one is a lot more awkward and kind of does a lot of character acting through mannerisms, and the other one is also kind of nerdy and awkward, but is more girl-obsessed and is always constantly trying to get with girls. So, it's basically Nico and Grady from Sunny with a Chance. Like, they fully just ripped off this dynamic and put it into this TV show. With the same races of the characters, too. Like, it's quite obvious. I feel like this would be brought up more if more people even cared about How to Rock and Sunny with a Chance. I actually remembered basically every episode of this show vividly. It just came out in that peak TV watching time for me, where all I did was watch TV and, like, eat gushers. <laughs> I had no other hobbies. It got cancelled after one season, but I remember they promoted the hell out of this show. They really wanted people to watch it. And I think it was kind of Nickelodeon trying again to do the whole Hannah Montana thing, because they failed with Victorious when it comes to selling music outside of the show. And then How to Rock probably got, like, no views. Got negative views, actually. So they just ended up throwing it away and scrapping it for parts. I went on YouTube and tried to find any videos uploaded while the show was still airing from fans of the show, and I see a lot of people saying they loved the diverse casting. This is basically the first time Nickelodeon had a black female main lead, so that was pretty cool. And also, I like Symphonique. I like a lot of her music. I liked her on that one song with Big Time Rush. And while I did make fun of the pop music being over-compressed and bad, because uh, most of it is, I honestly think it was on the same level as anything from Victorious, and I unironically listen to that album all the time, so who am I to judge? I guess it was kind of okay that it had this tired message of not being perfect, and it's okay to be weird and quirky, but that message kind of gets a little bit muddled when it comes to the main plotline of the main character. The reason why Symphonique's character ends up not being popular anymore is because she gets glasses and braces, and so she gets shunned for not looking pretty anymore because glasses and braces turns you into a freak, apparently. And that's why she's accepted by the outcasts of the school, and she ends up being the lead singer in their group. But then you find out that she can just not wear her glasses while she's performing live, and she just needs to wear a head brace at night so she doesn't need braces anymore. So she's back to being conventionally attractive again. And you're like, okay... So the message of this show is love yourself, and it's okay to not be perfect, but you need to be perfect, though, to be the main character. If you're not, if you're a loser, you're the side character, actually. Or you're, like, in one episode to prove a point and then never seen again. If you're used to Nickelodeon shows like iCarly and Victorious or Big Time Rush, this is a pretty stark drop in quality. I mean, I guess if you need a few hours of sludge to fill your brain because Full House has stopped airing, then go ahead. I don't know. Back to talking about Swindle, however. I don't know how I got so off track. Swindle is actually based on a book published by Scholastic. So basically, it was one of those books you could buy at like, your school book fair. I haven't had the privilege of being able to read this book, but from what I can tell, this is a in-name-only adaptation kind of situation. I did read a preview on Google Books, and it does seem to be that the characters have been aged up, and they don't even use the main basis for the plot of the book in this movie. They just took the name and then just did whatever they wanted with it. It's like, did this even have to be an adaptation? Because when I look up Swindle, it's like, oh, adapted from a book. And then you look at the book and you're like, this is a completely different series. I would say that this movie's actual main source of inspiration is Ocean's Eleven. I mean, now that I've mentioned it, it becomes obvious, like a little bit too obvious. The 2001 movie, by the way, not the original from the 60s with Frank Sinatra, which the 2001 movie was a remake of. No original content exists anymore, by the way. There's a lot of aspects I can see that are directly inspired by Ocean's Eleven in this film. 
Small things like having an ensemble cast where each character has a specific skill, not showing the audience the entire plan at the beginning and then just letting it play out throughout the film, even the jazz-inspired soundtrack, along with many other aesthetic choices. This movie can honestly be called a direct ripoff. Ocean's Eleven for children, basically. Like, if your mom didn't let you watch movies in the theater that were PG-13, you would go home and watch Swindle instead. So the premise of Swindle is that local anxious teenager Ben Dupree is moving away due to his father's failed inventions. Then his best friend Griffin Bing, who has this amazing talent of being able to basically get anything for anybody, he has connections, you see. They find a rare baseball card in the house walls, and they end up selling the card for $300 so his father can enter like a Shark Tank-esque invention show. And maybe get some money so they don't have to move. The next day they found out that the card wasn't worth $300, but actually $1.2 million. You love to see it. Griffin tells Ben specifically that they don't have time to look it up before they try and sell the card. So that's the reason why they didn't know the initial worth of the card before they sold it. So they had gotten swindled that's the name of the guy his name is swindle but it's pronounced swindell that's the funniest joke i've ever heard and his shop is called swindled so i don't know why they would sell anything to a guy named swindle but you know to each their own again for some reason griffin has really good connections so he decides to blackmail a bunch of high school students to uh, form a team to steal the card back even blackmail doesn't work on them though because you know if I was 16 years old, I wouldn't just automatically agree to commit a felony. Uh, but then $25,000 convinces them all to do it. $25,000 each, by the way. I would do anything for $25,000. I think I would literally kill somebody for $25,000. That that was a joke. I'm, I'm being serious, that was a joke. For $50,000, though, we're getting somewhere. I would tell the entire plot of this movie... Um, but I actually don't want to spoil it for people because I, I do think it's a fun watch. The pacing of this film is exquisite. There is not a single moment wasted in the entirety of this movie. Genuinely, when this movie popped into my mind randomly and I decided to sit down and watch it, I was surprised at how well this movie was paced and how funny it actually was. Of course, comedy is relative, so you could find this movie absolutely dull and not funny at all, but I think a good amount of the jokes still land for me. Plus, like I said, this movie is a very breezy watch. It goes by in a flash, and the script seems to be exquisitely crafted. It's not rushed like many TV show pilots are, like How to Rock, if I'm being honest. The pilot episode of that show really felt like it was on speed the entire time. They had too many things to fit into one episode. I need to stop talking about how to rock. And it's not paced like goddamn molasses, like movies like Quince or Ready to Run, which are just so simplistic and boring. Like, it's, it's hard to sit through. If you can't tell, I am currently attempting to watch every single DCOM ever made. That's where I am in the watch list currently. Sure, there are a lot of cliches and a lot of gags and jokes, but since this is a kid's film, I don't like turn on my like critic brain and like sit there and like make fun of every single element. I guess one might say it's a definition of a popcorn film, which I always assumed was a title given to movies where you go to see them in the theater basically because you want to eat the delicious popcorn and you're like, yeah, this kid's heist movie is a good excuse to eat a gallon of buttery, buttery popcorn. I genuinely just pop it on from time to time. I don't care if that makes me seem lame. This movie actually has one of the funniest jokes I've ever seen in a movie before, and I can't explain why I find it so funny, uh, but I'll include the clip here, and you can enjoy it for yourself. My favorite part, actually, is when they hint at a possible sequel that would never end up happening. Like, six months later, Ariana Grande is releasing her first album and is gone from Nickelodeon. So, so it wasn't just in the fate for this movie to become a series. Now it's time to do a character analysis. So I've mentioned Griffin Bing and his 
connections before, but I think this character is played completely unironically, and I think that's what makes me enjoy it so much. He is the definition of the extremely confident, nerdy loser guy. If he wasn't wearing the jeans and blazer combo that he's so well known for, I could see him wearing like khaki shorts and a green Legend of Zelda Triforce t-shirt. Like he gives off that kind of vibe. Like he's really lame and not popular at all, yet he's so confident that like you can't help but, you know, admire him in that way. My man wears silk pajamas. I don't know how else to describe this dude. It's clear that he actually really does care for Ben and they hint in like one scene that like he really doesn't have any friends because everyone just wants things from him and no one actually wants to just like hang out with him and talk with him but Ben has never asked him to do anything for him so like Ben is his only true friend and I like that I like how we get actual like character motivations for these people like he wants to get the card back not only because he's been duped by this dude but because he really screwed over his friend and just wants to make things right Plus, this guy acts like he's a super genius, but he actually is the least valuable member, I would say. His original plan of stealing the card really doesn't go over well, and he doesn't even realize until they're in the act of stealing the card that if they did steal it, they wouldn't really be able to sell it to anybody because then they would know that they stole it from them and then they get like arrested or no one would want to buy it. So they would have to go through like some third party person who would ask for their own cut and then you just wouldn't be getting as much money as you normally would. Which is when they then hatch the plan to have Swindle give them the card free and clear so they can sell it without any problem. Also, he ends up picking the least valuable members of the group. I would say that his sister, who she forces him to be involved in the plan, and Amanda Benson, who Ben picks out because he has a crush on her, those two girls are the most valuable members. They end up doing the most heavy lifting. And Griffin didn't even want them in the plan, so he clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. Now on to Ben. Now, Ben can seem like the character who actually has the least amount to do because he has no real skill set and he is very clumsy and awkward, so you would think that he would kind of be a nuisance throughout the film, but he actually does serve a pretty good purpose in the narrative. That purpose is to be the voice of reason and the audience surrogate. I don't know about you, but if I was a 16-year-old stealing $80,000 from some dude and scamming him to give me a card back and possibly becoming a millionaire all in one weekend, I would probably just be like, how about let's just not, let's just go home and just pretend none of this even happened. Because Ben does that at least two or three times throughout the film. He's just like, nope, we can't do this, I'm freaking out, let's just leave. And then Griffin has to be like, nah, dude, we're doing it. Like, I appreciate the honesty built into the script. The writers were like, yeah, this is pretty silly and outrageous, but it's still gonna happen anyways. So I think he adds a welcomed presence. Plus, he is the original owner of the card, so when they do get the card back, spoiler alert, and they do sell it for like a million dollars, he's just like, yeah, I'm a millionaire now. Whatever. Savannah Westcott is the first person that they get to be on the team. She's one of those like actress stereotypes that like overacts and is extremely dramatic and silly. And she does help a little bit. Her acting skills do get them into places where they normally wouldn't be able to get into. Like for example, how they actually end up stealing $80,000 from Swindle is that she pretends to be his daughter and just like books a room at the hotel that he's staying at. And since his card is already in there, they just they just charge his card. They just commit fraud casually. But other than moments like that, she very rarely ends up doing anything that useful. I mean, Darren says it himself. What does he say? It's like an actor girl. She's sucking wind. Yeah, yeah, he said it right there. Her father also ends up being involved in the twist plot. Yeah, this movie has a, has a twist. It's a lot better than anything M. Night Shyamalan has done in a long time. If I wrote that joke back in 2013 when this movie came out, that'd be a classic zinger. But it's 10 years later, and it's that's not funny anymore. Speaking of Darren Vader, he is hired as the muscle of the group because he's really strong, and also he has a van. Actually, that's the only thing of value he adds really to being in the group. He owns a van so he can drive them everywhere. 
that that ends up being pretty helpful. But in actuality, he ends up being more of an actor in the plot. They pair him with Savannah throughout the entire movie, and he learns to, like, work out his feelings through acting instead of punching things. That's, like, his arc throughout the movie. So very rarely does he actually do anything from his, like, character title, which is The Muscle. Like, they very rarely need him to, like, punch their way out of something, you know? But man, I do like Noah Monk as an actor, and I think he does a good job in this movie. He actually plays basically the same character in another movie where he gets to be the main character. I haven't seen that one in a long time, but it seems fun. Next, we have Amanda Benson, who again, I said, was picked by Ben. Ben is allowed to pick one member because uh, Darren Vader terrifies him, and he's like, if we're going to have Darren on the team, then I can watch Amanda. She's described as being the second prettiest girl in school, which, that's how high school works, everybody. She's a cheerleader and a gymnast, and again, she ends up being the most helpful. She's able to flip onto the roof of Swindle's shop and break in and let them in so they can try and find the card. And then in the very convoluted but interesting plot where they get Swindle to give them the card back, she ends up having to break into his hotel room as well, and again, that's like the most important key part of the story. And if she wasn't there, which Griffin really originally didn't plan her to be there, their plan really wouldn't have worked at all. Plus, they don't mention at all the fact that she's actually really good at prosthetics as well. She builds this man an entire new nose, which is quite impressive. Which, by the way, can I talk about for a second? I was surprised at the amount of, like, tired stereotypes are in this movie. For example, first of all, there's a moment where they have to trick Swindle into buying something from them so he can become in possession of it that'll become important later for the story. And so, for some reason, they have Savannah and Darren dress up as, like, German people. And then they do really offensive German accents, and it's like, did they have to be German? Did they have to do an accent? and speak fake gibberish that's supposed to be German, like, couldn't they just be, like, normal people? And then the guy who runs the auction where the card is going to be sold at, he's French, so he has, like, a silly French accent, and his nose is ginormous. I don't know if that's a French stereotype in particular, but I, I still find offense to it. Oh, and then there's a Russian guy, like a Russian mobster. Of course. So he has like a fake prosthetic scar on his face and he's like, Alexi and Boris. And you're like, oh, why are they doing this? Why? Again, he didn't have to be Russian. He could have just been, he could have just been like an American mobster or something. I don't know. I guess it's not that bad. I mean, but this was 2013. Like, come on, guys. I thought we were over this. But anyways, Amanda's main thing throughout the movie is that she's actually a big nerd and likes stereotypical nerdy person things. This was like peak geek chic time period, by the way, where like wearing those 3D glasses with like the lens popped out and having like a little mustache drawn on your finger was like peak hilarity and peak fashion. So the idea that this cheerleader that looked like Ariana Grande would be super into like Star Wars and Star Trek and stuff uh, was probably pretty novel to the writers. I really appreciate them for making her look like a nerd and then calling her Mandy the Mutant. The only time I've ever seen this movie be mentioned is from Ariana Grande stands who love to make gifts of that scene in particular. I find it very funny. Although I do think that element does actually aid in the story as well because we see that Ben has a huge crush on Amanda and of course it seems superficial because, you know, she's a cheerleader and he's just like a nerd. But then you find out they have a lot of similar interests with one another. Like they like the same properties and stuff and he just is really nice to her. So they actually do seem like they would be a good pair. Like it goes beyond the fact that like he's just a nerd and she's a cheerleader you know like they actually have reasons to be a couple and of course it's only ever hinted at but I, I think I think it would be cool and then finally we have Melissa Bing who would be the hacker she's literally the most valuable element of the group their entire plan would not work if it wasn't for her 
She's somehow able to hack into the hotel where everything takes place and fully gets like full security camera footage and access to like the elevators and everything. Like the entire plan would fall apart if it wasn't for her. I don't know how she's such an amazing hacker and apparently is like a seventh grader, but you know, good for her. And again, she's only added because she blackmails Griffin by saying that she'll tell their mom that they're uh, doing this very illegal thing if she's not involved. And so that's why she ends up being involved. I love her angry energy in this movie. I love a menace little sister. I can't get enough of a menace little sister. Plus, in general, I like Sierra Bravo. I really liked her in Wayne. I really wish that show didn't get cancelled. I liked that show a lot. I swear, one day I'm going to talk about Wayne. I really, really want to, but I just don't... I just don't have the time to. I have, like, five other things I need to talk about before that. I don't know, if you were to ask me, like, when I originally wrote this script, I would probably say, oh, this is a bad movie, and it's, like, it's a fun, like, so bad it's good film to watch with your friends when you, like, you know, get drunk or whatever. But now, I would totally say that, no, this is a good movie. I watched it with my dad recently, and he was laughing the entire time. He had so much fun watching it with me. I didn't even mention the ending scene with the wedding, where there's, like, an inexplicable like wedding cake food fight i don't know why but like i just i just enjoy that scene it was quite fun to watch i also just really like ensemble cast movies i feel like they're pretty underrated i swear movies that i've seen in actual theaters don't have scripts that are as well written as this movie's script is you can tell the script is written really well because every scene is perfectly timed and well managed yes it's a silly little kids movie but I really do think it's a fun watch, so I would go check it out if I were you. Okay, I promise immediately after I'm done editing this, I'm gonna get back to making them a bad video, so make sure to subscribe? I don't know. So far I have over an hour's worth of footage edited already, and I'm expecting the video to be a lot longer than that, so I'm quite excited for it to finally be out. Check out my podcast. I mean, it's just me and my friends talking and shooting the shit with each other. I only really edit them for fun. So go ahead and check that out if you're interested. Thank you for watching. If you're here, I'll see you with the Mabab video. Okay, bye.